Lara Marson is a New York City-based dancer, designer, director, and producer. Lara's heart is easily captured by unabashed grooves. She is a designer in the immersive space and an enthusiast of the stories bodies can tell. Among other things, Lara is interested in devising dance languages, making the surreal tangible, forming game interactions, creating live and filmed dance content for musicians, and designing fashion installations. Lara is obsessed with bringing out meaning through interaction. You can find out more about her from her website, laramarson.com. You can also look for her private dance lessons on hireartist.sharetribe.com. And if you are an artist looking for employment during the quarantine, you can join the Facebook group she created, which is gathering members very, very quickly, called Employing Artists. You can also find out more about her from Instagram, at Lara Marson. Welcome, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Talking about how you and I know one another. I had found out about this thing called the Mortality Machine. It was immersive, and I didn't know what immersive really was. Uh, was the, I had heard of Sleep No More at that time. I think that's about it. Uh, so I went to this callback audition in which you and Ryan Hart uh, put me through some improv exercises, and, and we talked, and I think you guys were just kind of trying to suss out who is this guy? Will he fit? Does he have the abilities? Um, and then from there, I went to an assisted LARP that Ryan put on. And eventually, we were practicing in the space to do the mortality machine. You were the director, designer, choreographer, one of the a co director and designer and choreographer. And very quickly, one of, uh, one of the people, one of the performers with the mortality machine on her way from the mortality machine to her other immersive dance job, slipped and what did she break her ankle? She just strained it? I believe she broke some part of her knee. Okay. Yeah, or no, maybe it was her ankle. No, it was her ankle. You're right. Yeah. It was something that required surgery. I don't know exactly what it was though. So we had like, we had just opened, I think, right? She had like two two performances, three performances with us? Maybe tops of us around two weeks. Yeah. Oh, okay. So more than that. Yeah. But she only was performing with us for a little bit of time because this would run for about two months or so, six performances a week. So, Laura, well, I guess I got to slip in there and be this character now, as well as having helped create this thing. So, Laura was very, very adept uh, you know, of course, being responsible for the artistry of the dance involved in the show, but very adept at at every facet. And like, clearly you are an actor and you just, you haven't had a chance to explore that as much as you would like, but you really have that ability. So, um, so yeah, talk about how did the mortality machine come to begin to be created? Oh, wow. That does have a long backstory. Uh, so, I came from the trajectory that leads into the immersive theater world and more broadly the immersive world um, from a place of developing. So I would produce and direct as well as choreograph and dance for these multidisciplinary performances that function sort of like, I suppose, vaudeville showcases could be a good comparison. and. That is what was my bread and butter during college. And after college, the first place my choreographic career took me was actually in the um, electronic dance music space. So I did the music video thing and the concert and tour thing. And I say that as though it was a very long and extended career. I didn't do it for very long. Um, but I um, choreographed a music video and worked on a couple artist tours. And then pretty early on saw that uh, or envisioned that my future, if I kept going in this direction, would take me to needing to build up a robust Instagram profile through which I tried to stay as popular as possible and try to network with a bunch of um, EDM artists and extended artists 
in order to keep being able to choreograph in that space. And then maybe I could make a jump at some point into film, but the nearish future would have been in, um, what I just said. And when I was envisioning this, it was outside of what I, the dreams that I had developed for choreography and for performance. Um, and though it suits some people, I had this longing for dance to not just be the quick feature movement moment of uh, flashing lights and like really impressive stuff and then okay back to the story or back to the main act. I don't experience dance as something that's an add-on. Um, in my training and in my life, physicality is integrated into everything. So I had this idea of wanting to envelop, envelop uh, dance into a storyline, uh, not only in characterizing or giving definition to different characters, say like, if there's aliens in a screenplay, like truly making, giving them their own alien definition, not even just stereotypical, but movies have had new languages developed for them. So I was like, oh, I could develop different posturing that doesn't exist elsewhere and like different body language that doesn't exist elsewhere. Anyway, so I had this goal and I found myself, um, uh, coming upon, through the recommendation of a friend, the group Everything Immersive, which mainly exists as a Facebook group, um, at least for my interaction with it, but people still, of course, know each other outside of it. And that was while I was in LA, and I started getting to know these people and just asking what was going on, like, what what's happening in this space? And then very soon after that, I moved to New York, and because I had hit it off with these people, I, together with somebody else, put on, put together the first in-person meetup of everything immersive folks in New York. And at that in-person meetup, I met Ryan Hart, who had reached out to the event, like to people within the event saying, is anybody a choreographer? And I mentioned like, oh yes, I'm a choreographer, thinking, oh, this person just has a question about dance and I'm like happy to sit with them and talk about whatever. But it became clear that he was looking to take on a project and we talked then and then we talked a few more times and I talked to his partner, business partner, um, Jay Knox. And when I talked to them, we ended up deciding we were going to make a show that was in his mind at first supposed to be a one um a singular event but it turned into <laughs> as you know because you were one of the leads or one of the cast members um a multi week <laughs> um production so that's how i ended up getting into <laughs> the mortality machine and we already spoke about how i ended up being in the mortality machine yeah yeah, so from the time that you and Ryan started to conceptualize this to the time that it was being performed, what's the difference between what you were conceptualizing on paper in conversation to what we actually ended up creating? Well, we didn't really have a precedent for what we were creating in the first place. So I don't know if we ever saw very distinct lines, even from the beginning. It was more of a, okay, let's trust um, our creative vision uh, to evolve us into a good space. I suppose um, we ended up making it a little bit more of an immersive theater production than we expected, or than he expected, uh, because Ryan, as you know, comes from a LARP background. So I think he expected um, the theatrics to not be so involved, perhaps, um, as they were during the mortality machine, and that um, the mortality machine 
had the flexibility in its course as any LARP does. It had very, um, I, I guess in my perspective, very specific scenic moments um, that were planned though flexible that would have perhaps been different had we not structured it um, had, we, had we not structured the theatricality of those moments so deeply, um, which may not have happened if we didn't decide, okay, we're going to make this like worth a theater um, description. This is going to be something that we like flesh out um, the impact of all the way through instead of just, okay, we'll give people these sandbox elements and then just see what the audience members throw together on their own. So, yeah. Yeah, it was a mixture of a lot of things and probably it's worth sharing for people that are listening and are ignorant to some of these, some of these theatrical uh, processes and uh, shows. We should probably mention what LARPing is. Uh, so, cause I didn't know what it was until I was, until Ryan said, I'd like you to join a LARP session to be prepared. Well, mm -hmm. I had friends who were LARPers. When I, when I started to act professionally, uh, a lot of my friends were, hey, you should try out SCA and you should try out LARPing. I'm like, what, SB, what? And so there are all these different types of, I don't know what you would call them, but there's, they're, they're facets of performance, of, of acting. Mm -hmm. So you've got Civil War reenactors, um, the SCA, which are people that reenact in the thousands with full body armor and everything, old wars from other eras. They get together once a year. The biggest thing they do is in July in Pennsylvania. It's global. And they all get together and beat the heck out of each other to reenact these moments. Then there's LARPers who are kind of like in the Dungeons and Dragons realm is how I would kind of put it, but an improvis Im improvised version of that. So there's, you're not necessarily throwing lightning bolts and being a, a dungeon master. You're being characters in a in a made up world or you're making up the world as you go along. What, how would you describe LARPing? So I would separate Dungeons and Dragons from what I understand more theatrical LARP to be. Um, and I think that all of the things you just listed definitely fit underneath the larger LARP umbrella. But theatrical LARP um, known in America as um, well, the strain in America is American style LARP. I think it's just plainly put like that. And then you know, we, we'll maybe need to look online to double check that I'm correct. And that came a bit after Nordic LARP. And Nordic LARP was the beginning of this very theatrical um, role play experience where it wasn't just people sitting around a table speaking about what their characters are doing, which is what happens in D&D. It was the assignment of characters to these people, the preparation of that character before going into the experience, as actors would do, as you well know, um, and then playing out this experience of being that character within the world that was pre-prepared for the production or the LARP and doing that in character, ideally the entire time, except when you make a point of breaking. So it's a test of really living out pieces of life or pieces of whatever worlds um, are being created in these uh, productions as another person, as that character. Right, and so the acronym is live action role playing. So, yes. Clark, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the mortality machine, what was interesting about it, and one of the reasons why it had the, the good reviews that it did, it had a mixed bag of reviews, but there were some very good reviews. Um, at one point, we were listed as one of the top five immersive experiences in New York. That's huge, mm -hmm. um, but, but we were a mixture of, uh, if you were coming to see this show, you were going to see acting, you were going to see improvisation. It's going to be very theatrical. You were going to see and be involved in dance. 
It was an escape room. And uh, I don't know if I'm missing anything out or leaving anything out, but- I think, um, I think it's probably best to uh, mention that it was not intended to be an escape room that would incorporate escape room elements. And it actually uh, ended up being something that was detrimental to the experience to imagine it as an escape room. So though there were clues to uncover, I'll just say that if one went into it thinking it was an escape room, it did not fulfill what they were looking for. Sure, sure. So. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing about the mortality machine experience, because it did evolve and change, those course corrections were a regular part of uh, of the notes. And um, oh yeah, <laughs> because we had to we had to steer the guests into particular directions. It was a choose your own adventure, as well as all the other things but there were only a handful of scenarios that could play out. So we had to facilitate as well as perform mm -hmm. to, to make, to ensure that that happened. Mm -hmm. So there was talk with the mortality machine towards the end about, we're going to bring this back on a bigger scale and maybe we'll keep it in New York. Maybe we'll go to London. Maybe we'll go to New Orleans, maybe Chicago. There was all this talk about possibly bringing it back up. Do you know if it's going to happen or not? So, the easiest answer to that is I have no idea, <laughs> nor do I think Ryan has an idea. Uh, we developed a smaller version of the experience that allowed for three people at a time to come through after that. And we brought that to Dragon Con in, um, that was last August. We brought that to Dragon Con last August and it seemed to go very well. And we adjusted certain things about the original design that I think we would probably want to stick with for a later release. But um, in terms of making a full size production again, I don't know, in a, even if we had had plans, I'm sure that they would have been <laughs> thrown out the window by now with uh the environment that we're in so yeah the short answer to that is i don't know the mortality machine was an experiment in seeing what people can pick up about story from only being able to interact with performers via touch and dance and both of those things being codified so a lot of immersive productions use techniques from gameplay to teach, I guess, uh, audiences how to interact with the experience as they go along in a seamless way. And my goal with the departed characters who were the characters that when you first meet them, you could only interact with them through dance, the space was dedicated to movement and touch. Um, so that their interaction was a an experiment in that. And it seemed to be a somewhat successful, like a good first try maybe at, <laughs> at giving audiences the opportunity of like, okay, whoa, I don't have language at my disposal. I don't have verbal language at my disposal. How do I engage like intimately with this person without it? And what do I get from that? Um, so yeah, we can, I, that would be what I feel like I packaged from that experience. So how would you describe your artistic vision? Uh, so I immediately go broadly when I asked this, I, because, and I think that's fitting because I end up shifting what type of thing I'm working on as I go through my career. But my goal with any art that I put together is for people, including the performers, but for people engaging with the artwork to be ignited in themselves and in their connection to other people. And what I mean by that is I want people who engage with whatever art I create to 
feel a clarified sense of that present moment in which they're engaged, that they're engaging with the art and have like a refreshed look at themselves and um, what they want, probably um, prompted by different things that they're interacting with in my art piece. And then um, the connection to other people part, meaning that I love to create pieces that in some way or another generate understanding of different people in the space and also of different people broadly. And that's whether you're talking about dance or any art form, that's what your interest is? Yeah, yeah, and I find myself just existing within the dance space because I exist in there in myself. <laughs> so even though my most recent project is building this virtual game set um, that I hope to release at some point of this year, although it's a, it's turned into a bit of an undertaking <laughs> to try to make it a full blown thing. But um, even in that, a lot of it is not strictly dance by any means, but anyone who engages with it will see that physicality comes up quite often and creative physicality that I see as being on a spectrum within dance, dance not in my eyes being something that's limited to a specific style or specific styles, but at its root being a human experience of expressing oneself through physical, physical means. And that expression just takes a ton of different forms over time, depending on whatever cultures spawn <laughs> mm -hmm. as history moves along. I think we can agree that your, your focal point is dance or movement, right? I tend to see through that lens, yeah. Right. So how did art enter your life? Did it, were you just a kid dancing around and this was just part of being Laura or was, was art introduced to you in some way and then you flourished from that? I'll say that dance has been a part of my life quite literally before I can remember. Um, my mom said that um, I would dance to the sound of a toilet flushing uh, so that would be my soundtrack. Uh, I mean, and other not as strange things. Um, but art, I would say, came into my life more during college because I grew up in a community where art was very much understood to be a hobby. And even though I could see actors on screen or in plays or whatever, I had this view of, oh, yeah, those people do that, but they do that. That doesn't mean that I can do that. I can only do art as this thing that makes me happy alongside of whatever job I do. So I only embraced the idea of possibly being an artist professionally during college and really taking it seriously more than just, oh, I'm making these things for fun, but no, I really want this to um, be in front of people. I want to see how people react to this. I want to know more artists and see what we can make together. I want to see what slight changes in the world can be had from what we're making. Like that, yeah. So that all started um, in college most distinctly. And now, fast forwarding to you're, you're in Southern California, you come to New York, I'm sure you had a whole experience as we all do in making that transition. And New York <laughs> is not an easy place to just hop into. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so if you could, just for at least a couple minutes, share what that transition to New York was like. Oh my Lord. <laughs> It was so hard. I would not suggest to 
anyone to travel to at least that city, maybe most cities, with the thought of, I'll just see what happens. <laughs> um, like perhaps some bit of that, but having a um, a home, so to speak, to go into, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have your whole life organized, but have yourself entering into a situation that takes care of you in major ways from the get-go, um, that would have been way <laughs> helpful. <laughs> um, it was a rough, it was a rough uh, first year plus, I don't know, first two years, whatever. Um, but it was, I mean, New York has also been wonderful in that the primary reason why I left LA um, which was that these visions I had for my artwork I thought would be fulfilled more easily in New York. That did come true. The New York artists impress me so much. I'm, I'm amazed by like not only the talent, but also the vision and vigor <laughs> or like die hard grunt <laughs> that, um, that everybody or that most of the artists I came across have, um, which made it possible to constantly do things that were experimental. It's, it's a culture of, oh, that's something new that you want to try. Yes, let's give it a shot. And, it, and giving it a shot doesn't even have to mean let's make it into a full production, but there's this willingness to spend time on something that's um, a new idea. And that was so nurturing for my artwork. Um, and I'll take that with me regardless of where I'm living and hopefully make it <laughs> more of a thing wherever I do live. Yeah, where did your artistic mind go, your spirit go when all of a sudden close the doors, don't leave, happen. When you're all of a sudden in lockdown, for a lot of us as artists, it was, wow, not fun. I, I was starting to lose my head uh, until we started picking this show back up because now I have 40 hours a week to put into something again. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, which is still half the amount of time I was putting into my acting, but it's something and it gives me a structure. Yeah. So share what that did to your head and spirit. So, as is likely the case for so many people, it was maybe within the course of 24 hours that I realized, and this was March 11th for me, maybe it was other days for other people, I realized that all of the income that was ahead of me, that I, all of the income sources that were ahead of me that I had scheduled, were gone. And when that happened. I, I was a, um, my side gig was being a cater waiter. So obviously large gatherings for catering events also were not allowed as well as large gatherings for dance production. So um, I immediately started looking for jobs because I thought, okay, I have to survive. This is how I, <laughs> I, I need to shift right now in order to do that. And I didn't only look for jobs. I was looking for um, sources of funding and um, any artist calls or it, essentially anything that could bring in income. And since I was doing that, and I knew from experience that I was not always aware of what opportunities were out there. And knowing about opportunities is a huge part of helping one's career. So I decided that whatever I came across, since I would already be researching a ton anyway, I would share with people in an environment where they could also share whatever they come across so that we could all help each other out because my mentality was like this is <laughs> oh I don't need to curse but things were quite dire of course um so 
I, uh, so I built employing artists as a way to also just feel like I was engaging with this community of people that I knew was suffering and could empathize with the suffering of, um, to, because I saw that the quickest way we could, uh, help each other or, or the quickest way we could get ourselves into less dire positions would be to help each other and to have help from whoever else. So, um, so the goal of employing artists is not just um, for side gigs or anything like that. It's, of course, side gigs are also posted, but it's for job searches for jobs either that are really easy to put alongside of one's art practice or that match people's artistic skills. There's also artist calls for residencies, for grants. I will post things that are related to government funding or um, government resources like advocacy. And, um, and yeah, so that was a big, uh, I, I guess, um, undertaking that came immediately from um, going into COVID quarantine and that was, you asked about my artwork and it's not exactly related to my artwork except that it's employing artists but it definitely was related to my spiritual um journey through this as i'm sure this is fulfilling this podcast is fulfilling you spiritually in ways i, I i'm making that assumption um and then in terms of my art practice i definitely have had my moments of um <laughs> I don't know the best way to call it, but sort of a blankness, which I had never experienced before, uh, a kind of like shutdown. But ooh, I'm lucky that I haven't experienced too much of that. And I think I'm extra lucky that I had built this show, my first self-produced show, uh, sort of clubhouse, which, was an in-person participatory experience of performance art and gameplay. I had these games that I had built for that, that I was going to, it, the show I was going to show in Boston, I was going to show it if, in its hard opening dates in New York, I was thinking of taking it to LA. So I was like, well, I have all of this material of games that I had built for this because games were a big part of that performance. Um, what uh, what better thing to do for remote artwork than use something that I already spent so much time and care on and transition that into a virtual space. So since the beginning, I've been attempting to turn those into something that people can experience virtually and that people can experience with each other in person, but using um, a laptop to be prompted through the games. Um, but as I had a suspicion of when starting to transition, the virtual space is just very different. Like we hone our skills in the physical space. That's, there's a reason there's different industries around these things. And in transitioning to making something that people primarily engage with virtually, I've talked to gamer friends of mine. I've talked to you, user experience friends of mine. I've had multiple play tests and it's still, um, there's a lot of culture and expectation and um, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess just culture and expectation around the way that people experience things virtually already. So. Uh, that all to say that um, this undertaking is much longer than I thought, but it's still been fun. And I've also ramped up my uh, dance lesson practice, which has been great to be able to do virtually still. Yeah, um, and you're doing you're doing another one of those classes tonight after this interview, not too, not long I after this. I'm doing it tonight. Yes, the 
goal for the dance classes is to, well, they're donation based and they're open level. So any amount of dance experience can come in. And given that I've had some experience creating dance workshops for people with various kinds of mobility, they also are hopefully quite accessible and I'm open to more feedback on that. I have um, in my description the accessibility of it. So, and I have closed captioning through the whole thing. So the goal with these is for people to feel whole in their experience, meaning like not just be in their heads, but also like remember what it feels like to be in their bodies and do that creatively and do that in a fun environment. Um, and we don't only do things that are specific to dance. We do things within just the creative movement realm. And I'm not teaching any one style, although we may come across styles. It's, um, it's more about that imaginative and um, collaborative creative movement space. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for doing this. It's a wonderful thing to share this. Bye. Bye.